City Futures Research Center. Um, and welcome to today's um, re uh, research seminar. Um, Chris Pettit, our director, is going to do the introduction for the speaker, but I thought before we start, just first want to acknowledge that um, UNSW is located on the lands of the Digital and Gattaca people. Um, and so I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and any First Nations people who might be joining us or watching online. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you're joining us online, if you could help us out by uh, muting your microphone and turning off your camera during the presentation, uh, that's helpful. And then at the end, if you'd like to turn on your camera or your mic uh, to ask a question, please go ahead. I'll be monitoring the chat though during the presentation as well. So if you want to put a, a comment or a question into the chat, uh, we can we can ask those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Pettit, who's the uh, professor. Chris Pettit, the director of City Futures Research Center, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Lee. Welcome everyone who are in the City Analytics Lab and everyone who is online. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, one of our research fellows, Dr. Vala Selmdararaj, yeah. um, who is going to present a really, I think, engaging talk um, on spatial data visualization, looking at what's happened over the last 20 years, um, and then with some examples, I guess, more recent examples of what's been going on, the work that Bala has been doing here at City Futures. Um, his bio, we we're very fortunate that Bala made the decision to, to join us here at University of New South Wales City Futures after undertaking his PhD at University College of London with Professor Paul Longley in the Department of Geography. Um, Bala brings a wealth of experience. Um, he is also the manager, the lab manager for the City Analytics Lab that some of us are in today and has a vast knowledge and experience in all things spatial and visualization. So I'd like to welcome Bala to the podium. Thanks, Ben. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction and uh, thanks to you for organizing this. So, um, let's start. All right. So, essentially, like, um, I would like to start with what we're going to do today. So, we have 60 minutes. We'll start with like the introduction. It's already taken up five minutes of our time. So, I'll start with myself and my journey in uh, spatial data visualization. And then I'll go over the development of web mapping and spatial with the last 20 years, like 18 years. Uh, and then I'll show up examples of like what we're doing in City Futures currently and the issues we have been tackling with and like the solutions we have come up with. And we have, we'll have like 15 minutes and again for questions and discussion. Um, so to begin with, before we start, I would like to have like two disclaimers. Um, one is this talk is not like the traditional uh, seminar series talk, like where we have a project and then we talk about the results of the project. This is mostly derived from my experiences and my journey in spatial data analysis. And I don't have a computer science background. So most of the stuff which I'm going to be talking about would be from a planning or a application perspective. So I'm a planner and basically like how I see things and how I kind of learn them and use them in my uh, field. Uh, and second one is like I have a strong preference for open source, free software, especially to your new GPL license. So most of the stuff I work with and most of the stuff I'm going to talk about will be um, more biased towards open source and free software. Um, the opinions regarding them are mine, so yeah, but, um, I would not, I would not want them projected on like the broader community. Um, that being said, like so. Basically, I have like three parts to this uh, story, right? One is like me starting as a planner and how did I end up here, right? So what I have done and how my view of uh, spatial and my knowledge of spatial data visualization has moved. So to begin with, um, this is like me, how it looks in the last 20 years of my life. Um, so the first two years of school, but it's better than saying 18, so I just say took two decades, right? So basically, like. 2005, I started uh, my bachelor's in planning. So I did my uh, bachelor's in planning. Then I worked as a consultant for a, uh, as a transport planner 
for did some transfer planning work. Then I worked for two years as a consultant in real estate industry. So shopping centers, um, doing analysis for them. Then after that, I did like uh, spatial analysis from UCL as masters. Uh, one year of that, then I uh, worked with Transport for London yeah. and uh, UCL in a knowledge transfer partnership. That was an odd one because that was project management research, but using network analysis, so which I was kind of like specializing in my masters. Then after that, I did my PhD in uh, geography, human geography with the department of uh, geography UCL. Um, looking at pedestrian movement and like how to um, use sensor data to count footfall in places. Worked there for a year as a research associate with Consumer Data Research Center. Um, then I'm here in City Futures for the past three years as a research fellow working with uh, Chris and team. So basically, essentially like to sum up, like I'm a planner, kind of like I've developed into a social data scientist who has a special specialization towards network analysis and visualization. So in terms of like how, how did visualization start, right? So in 2005, like when I was starting with like basically first year planning students to draw maps with hand-drawn maps. Um, we didn't have data. Data collection is like going to like places, getting like physical data, um, physical maps, putting them on blue blueprints, like pouring ammonia in that corner. So that that used to be the data collection process. The analysis used to be like us um, drawing on maps, like and visualization is like coloring the maps. So that's like uh, initially 2005. Then being in an architecture school, you get like AutoCAD, right? So AutoCAD is like a um, architecture oriented CAD, um, design software. So that's where like you get like your um, data collection your mapping starts from where you draw the maps. And around this time, like Google Earth was released. Like, so that was my first foray into like, so you get like free open um, data on like every, anywhere. So you get like images from Google Earth, use AutoCAD, to, like draw them up, geocode them, and do your maps. Um, if you want 3D, you can do like some, some kind of like sketch up, like simple tools, right? Most of them are self-learn. Try my life with Blender, not too bad back then. Uh, then end of my uh, bachelor's, you you get like more in, um, information about ArcGIS. I think we are in ArcMap 8, ArcGIS. I've used ArcGIS 3.2 with Ruby backend, which is like, I don't know, how did I do that? But then that was the time when like you started to get like spatial data from online, um, online um, sources like Google. And then we, we start to realize like, okay, so data set, we need to do analytics on the data and visualize them, um, and then may, maybe do something with that. Then I did like two years of consulting, just office. That, that, that <laughs> really, nothing else. Like, you, you have an SOE, which has nothing else. You got PowerPoint. <laughs> so that, that's how like the PowerPoint looks this good. So two years of very <laughs> um, Then that one year in UCL is where like, I kind of like got immersed in like geospatial technology. So, to, to summarize, like R was the my favorite language of coding. So I speak mostly R and few dialects of like um, JavaScript, uh, HTML, and stuff like that. Then we that was the time when I think like 2012 to 2014 was like a big change. I'll, I'll come to that in the next part. I'll tell the story. That was a huge change into like you the open source data was coming to age and then like Mapbox was coming up. Carto DB was like an open source project back then. So a lot of things were happening. And that, that one year I kind of like, I was living in the halls to the uh, Casa halls to the Casa. There's like two points of my life, like almost eight months or so I spent there. But most of the stuff I know started from that one year. Um, and then spent two years doing network analysis specifically uh, with Kefi, iGraph. So this is um, this is where like I started getting into like software development. So trying to collect data from people and getting like complex data from people in terms of like how they communicate with each other, how they related to each other, that uh, kind of stuff. So that's where like the PHP comes in, MongoDB comes in. That was um, the time like where software development stuff uh, was there. And PhD is where like the big data engineering comes in. 
So um, a bunch of images here. The key ones are you you get into Postgres SQL. So Postgres was a database of choice for geospatial stuff. It has an extension called PostGIS, um, which kind of completes your your language for dealing with spatial data. So once your data is in Postgres, and if you have PostGIS installed, so then you can actually talk to the database to get most of the spatial um, operations done with that. So that was like one of the key things which I learned. And then uh, another thing which was uh, important was like for a, like some sysadmin stuff, like getting like clusters set up so that you can actually do big data processing. So the data set I was dealing with was uh, coming from sensors. It's like two gigabytes of data every day. So you kind of like try to parallelize everything you have. You kind of like scale up everything you have. Um, so that's my PhD and my yeah. And that brings me to City Futures. So this is where like we um, in City Futures, like this was pretty much like anything to do with AWS. So we have like a huge uh, AWS cluster here. Learned everything about EC2, ECS, deploying containers there. Um, this is the place where I focused on visualization the most. So we have so many projects, and one of the projects I worked with was Value Australia. It's um, using big data and AI models to um, produce automated valuation for properties at a national scale. So the visualizing that data sets and okay. visualizing the models and um, their outputs was like my last three years of my life. So uh, learn more about um, explore more into um, Shiny, Kepler, like the new GPU-based uh, front-end libraries, which can do mapping very fast, and some in-memory database like OmniSpy, um, more Python stuff. So that's where I come from. So basically, like I start from drawing maps with uh, in hand, doing planning, planning-related reports to Managing like a small AWS cluster uh, of containers which run like daily data input and produce a dashboard of for property market. So in that's what like my knowledge space looks like in terms of where um, the things I know, what I use them for. This specific, the next story is about like the analysis and visualization from and communication part of that knowledge space. So essentially what, what I would like to talk about is like in terms of visualizing and like spatial data visualization, like the discussion stops at 2005 when like GIS was complete like from 1980. It's getting more and more stuff coming in. And 2005, it's just like once Google Earth starts, Google Earth, Google Maps stops, like the GIS discussion kind of like hints. And I want to focus on the next part, like what happened after that? Like what are the developments happening right now? So that like, which we can use. So summarize, um, I'm a social data scientist, dealing with spatial data, uh, move between multiple um, aspect, um, fields, and then like learn various aspects of um, visualization. And there's no straightforward boundary for my experience like this all over the place. So that brings me to the second part of the um, talk today. So it's like th this one is very, um, it's based on my experience of like what I have seen since then. Some of them are before, I, before in my time, I would say like when I started doing spatial stuff. So if you start with like looking at GIS, time, timeline of GIS, it will start somewhere around 1960s. And then it will go from like S3 was founded, um, Project Autonomous Thesis, and then it, it just like, and you can see like there are like a few, um, there are lots of developments around 90s. 90s has been like the internet started like adding to the stuff. Tiger data set was released in um, US. So, and then you can see like a lot of activity around 2000, um, around 2005, and that's where like the GIS activities kind of like stop. So if uh, even if you like take a course in like cartography, cartography will start from like maps, cartographers, projections, GIS, and then it stops. 
So the last 15 years is where like most of the innovation has happened. And I see the activities in the last um, 20 years, like, like say like 2000 to like 2023, last 20 years, happened in like four sections, right? The one is like the GIS and spatial analysis community, uh, open source community has worked a lot in the last 20 years to get like tools out, to get data sets out. Um, then Google being Google, like they just railroaded their stuff. Like they came up with Google Maps and like they have their own whole set of uh, offerings there, which is miles ahead of everyone. And OpenStreetMap community has done like a major work in the last 20 years establishing that. And then around 2015, Silicon Valley VC venture capitalist money started flowing into like mapping spatial visualization. So those are kind of like in the play now. So like last 10 years, it's been those are the people who are um, pushing the envelope in terms of like visualization uh, in the field. So let's start with GIS and spatial analysis. Like you can see 99 shapefile was shapefile format was released. 2000 ArcGIS 8. That was like when the GIS was kind of started to become ArcPy was released around that time. So you can use Python to like use your ArcGIS stuff. Um, ArcGIS 9 had that model maker thing, so where you can connect stuff uh, between connect data sets and create your analysis in there. Um, and then you can see like QGIS also like parallelly started around that time. 2002 QGIS was launched, and 2018 when QGIS 3 was launched, I consider that as like the moment where like QGIS become like complete. So QGIS 2 and 3, there was like a huge difference in terms of like how much data it can handle, how much, um, how fast it can do stuff. Um, then Python also had its uh, libraries develop around like 2014, GeoPandas was released. Polium was like kind of a visualization library on top of Python. Um, in our world, basically like I was released in uh, 2000. We had SP released in 2005. That's where like most of my work started. SP was like a library on R, which kind of like abstracted all the spatial data sets for in R's data structures. Um, then R Studio and R Shiny were like the next um, step, which um, Harley Wickham and like their team started building stuff on that. And 2015 was like before, I, around the time I started my PhD, S SF Simple Features stuff, uh, package was released. And that kind of like changed how we did how we thought about doing um, spatial filtering and queries inside R because there was like a more pipeline based approach where you can chain commands together. So earlier it was basically manipulating objects with functions. Then with SF and Tidyverse, it became like you have like functions passed around, um, objects passed around through functions using um, pipes. So all you can see is like, so the summary of this would be around 2005, opens um, around from 2000 to 2018. I would say like all the tools which used to be proprietary. Before 2000, if you want to do GIS, like you need to have a GIS. You either you are in a university or you are in a company which licenses that. 2018, if you want to do um, GIS um, analysis, you can just download QGIS and get going. Almost all of that is like completed, com completely changed uh, in an open source format. So we can do GIS now. Then it brings like Google. So Google is a, that it, it, it basically trans it transformed the whole thing, right? So I think it was like an unintended consequence of the Iraq war. Um, there, there was like discussion that like Keyhole used to be a um, mapping company or like um, spatial um, mapping company who stole their satellite imagery data to news organizations during Iraq war for their promotion, like for their reporting. So that made them really famous. And Google acquired them in 2004, looking at what they can do with their globe. Um, they were actually start from gaming where they, they had this globe for a game and then they put like um, satellite imagery on it. That then the 2005, they kind of released Google Earth, Google Maps, um, and then they released an API to use Google Maps for your own projects. That was like kind of like 
um, very, um, what do you say, like miles ahead of like what people had at that point of time. And from 2005 to 2012, those APIs were free. And I remember like learning most of my stuff from that. Like, so you can use the APIs. They had like a free tier where you can get, um, you can do analysis on them using Google's uh, API. You can visualize Google's, um, you can visualize points on them like as much as you want. Almost like you never run out of the free tier. Um, that was like a golden age of Google-based visualizations. Like, there was like a lot of research which used Google. A lot of maps were published using Google. API version 3 in 2009 was kind of like a game changer in terms of like how fast it was, how nice it looked, and it was mobile. You can look up the maps in mobile without any um, effort. Um, then 2012, they started monetizing their um, API. They introduced some paid tier and the free API keyless once ended in 2018. 2018 was the last time you can actually like use Google Maps API without an account with them on a Google Cloud account. Um, but they still have the most comprehensive data set in terms of businesses. Uh, businesses, where things are, localities, so. Um, they have more non-traditional data sets like how busy a place is. Um, walking directions are much more accurate than most people have. So, but they have a very expensive API we can deal with. So that's Google's part of it. And then OpenStreetMap, this was like a, <laughs> if I remember right, this was kind of a people who got annoyed by Ordnance Survey in UK because they won't release their Ordnance Survey map. So they didn't release it till 2010. So basically they want to create their own OS uh, must map by mapping it on their own. So 2005 was like the first commit in London, I think. And so along this, like a lot of tooling was developed in terms of taking the data from OpenStreetMap and making your own maps with it. So one was like how to convert the OpenStreetMap data into um, an image-based uh, map. So um, 2007, where Tiger data was completed for US, it was imported into OpenStreetMap completing like US uh, road network. A um, lot of companies started giving their satellite imagery for OpenStreetMap um, for free for, to be able to digitize. So Bing did it in 2010. Yahoo did like a bit earlier. Um, one of the most important ones here is like CloudMate, which had which raised like six million or something uh, um, at that time to do mapping service based on OpenStreetMap. I think that was one of the first companies who got funding to do OpenStreetMap based uh, navigation services. So essentially like that kind of like built the uh, tooling around that. Like so people built Google Earth, uh, open source Google Earth replacements like CCMJS. Um, Leaflet was made into built in kind of like a simpler open layers, which you can use any tile sets provided by OpenStreetMap uh, based data, and then you can use leaflet to draw on. So a tile set would be something which is like a base map, which you could generate from an open street map, and then you would draw on top of that. Um, as 2018 was like a kind of time when Foursquare, Apple, and everyone kind of moved away from Google because it's getting more expensive. And recently, like there's a Linux Foundation um, um, effort called Overture, so they are trying to get like a, a something similar to Linux, an open source uh, method of getting spatial data, making it available for everyone. So that's an uh, interesting thing to watch for, for the future. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly now. So basically like this is the most recent stuff, right? Mapbox 2010 was like kind of the key moment. They took OpenStreetMap data, combined like other data sets, other sources, and they were confident that they can produce something like Google Maps for cheaper. Um, and I remember like going to Mapbox events and their Mapbox Studio they had was kind of like revolutionary at that point of time and free. CardoDB did the same thing. It was used to be a open source library where you can put in your um, OpenStreetMap data and you can have like a spatial database where you can do SQL queries, visualization on top of that. Um, one of the key things happened around 2015 
Before 2015, most of the services were using uh, raster maps, raster tiles, where you take the data, you kind of, for each level of Zoom, you kind of render the uh, tiles and store them in a, a server, and that gets served for, for your view. So if you're looking at a map and at a certain Zoom level, so those PNG images or like a JPEG images will be there. Mapbox MVT specification around 2015, uh, 2014 and 2015, and S3 agreed to support MVT as like a format in their products. So that kind of like made that raster tiling redundant. So there's like a huge push against like making ve vector tiles and then using vector tiles to like do base maps uh, was kind of become feasible there. Uh, uh, that was the time around like um, Uber was, uh, doing their own uh, team. So they had a team which worked on using data coming from their um, apps people are using, like drivers are using, and visualizing that at a large planetary scale. So this team went on to build uh, DeckGL, ResGL. So these are all like um, graphic libraries which use the GPUs, the like graphic processing in it, to do. Um, much, much faster. Uh, so for example, MVT layer. So if I give a layer of uh, a million points, it would be like, orders of magnitude faster to do it with GPU rather than like the CPU. So these libraries use that to create like um, visualizations on the client side much, much faster. So I remember like drag and dropping um, a file with like a million points in them and it just visualizes that in your browser clean. So that, um, and then they kind of like, Facebook developed React as a framework. They moved to React framework and built like this Kepler GL as a showcase for what these libraries can do. So that team left, quit Uber, went and founded their own company called Unfolded AI. Foursquare bought them, so it kind of become like a, a circle of like people going everywhere. So this, this, this is what's happening in like spatial, um, in, the Silicon Valley side, right? So DeckGL and MVT, MVT has become like a standard in terms of uh, vector tiles, and most of the web mapping um, libraries use MVT as like a uh, format they use to like do their tiles. Um, Google also pushed them up with, with their open, uh, sorry, WebGL based maps earlier. So they have their own um, pipeline of stuff they keep doing. So essentially, like this, this is kind of how I see it, right? So 2015 is the moment where like the OSM data was almost complete, and a lot of companies like took the OSM data, uh, including Apple, combined it with their own data sets, and kind of started having um, mapping services and mapping libraries, platforms where you can just like use upload your data and uh, do that. So. The expected evolution of online web GIS when I was in um, undergrad was like this, right? So initially we had desktop GIS, get the data from the desktop GIS went into a database, and then there was a map server which took the map uh, mapping part, and finally your, your GIS, uh, desktop GIS will go into the web. But the last bit never happened. So it, it, it happened, but much later with ArcGIS Online around 2012. Uh, that never went mainstream. It was like, it was a very, um, it, no, most people never used the actual GIS online. What they got experience was like a mapping, um, web mapping service, which is like either Mapbox or like leaf, using leaflet on a um, Cardo DB or something like that. So a common a web mapping application will have like three layers, right? So one is the base map, which Earlier was done by raster tiles. Mapnik was used to do that. There was a whole um, effort that went on to get like that base map done, which I think is almost complete now. So you can get like OpenStreetMap data and render that with, with some styling defined. You can render that as like a base map quite easily. Now, uh, then the data layers and how to um, depict them in a, uh, on a web browser side. That's also almost um, in like it, it's complete. Basically, like DeckGL and WebGL does like really good um, 
if you are serving your data as vectors, it can blazing fast render them on your browser. And currently there are like a few developments in terms of um, web assembly. So it's basically what happens is like your browser can run code as good as like native applications. So they, the, the libraries which use them can actually render these uh, uh, data much faster. And UA elements, um, yeah, I've, I've dealt with bootstrap, it's, but now it's more like it, it has matured as well. So essentially what, what I think is like GIS community kind of lost out on that web uh, GIS phase. And web mapping kind of become like the part of it. And the issue I find it's like most of the web mapping applications was originates from a routing perspective. So OpenStreetMap data is made for routing, navigation and routing. So it's kind of like it it has a I used to have like a lot of problems trying to put the uh, research data on top of these maps, which are meant for like routing purposes. So getting actual GIS worthy data from OpenStreetMap used to be like a big um, problem like in, back in 2012. And third thing is like open source community has kind of completed most of the traditional GIS which we can use. So we can pretty much like use uh, uh, GIS in the open source way. And we are, I think like we are at the junction, like around 2020, we are at the junction where like tech is mature on both data back end and front end. And the challenge is like just getting them to use us in a, a, a accessible way. So that's that's the background uh, on when I joined City Features, right? So essentially like I had all the tools and stuff ready. And like we we had like something um mature to do the job of what for that. Uh, one of the mandate we had was like to be able to take all those big data sets we had and all the complex modeling the modeling team was doing and visualize that in a simple, not much simple, like in a clear way to the user. So we have another 10 minutes to go. So as we spent like, so I spent 2020 and 2021, like exploring and building dashboards. Um, we even built a library for our own on a, uh, for a well Australia project and exploring platforms to put that data in and like it like once. So one of the first ones we used like CityWiz. Uh, CityWiz is built by, I think Brian was part of it. Okay. We didn't have much to do with it, but I was here. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's kind of part of the City Futures website. We have like, um, Visualizations on there, like done in different platforms, such as one in Tableau, you can see, and then another one is Carto. So it's kind of like a showcase of all the research which we do, City Futures. And then um, 2020, like when the COVID um, lockdown started, like we built the COVID property dashboard in like four weeks time. One of the challenges, this was built in Shiny, so which I wanted to like test that, or not test it out, which I wanted to see the push, push it to the limit, seeing like how far it can take it. It was very good for rapid prototyping. We built the dashboard in like two weeks. Um, essentially, we spent another two weeks like trying to get the dashboard to the public in a scalable way. The scaling part you can see on the right side where um, the Twitter data service, scalable service container, that on AWS was like a big pain. So uh, it, the dashboard got picked up by media. So once uh, if it gets, goes to the Guardian front, front page of Guardian, like you get like 15,000 hits in within like two minutes. So we, we were trying to build a service which can scale up and then like scale down when uh, it goes down. So that was the major pain with Shiny. And we solved it like by making a lot of hacks in them, um, but it did work and it's still working. So that's so that the learning was like Shiny was good for our shiny was good for rapid prototyping of stuff. And the map there is made by uh, Leaflet. It works, it works fast, but scaling it up for production is very tough. And then um, in the modeling side, like so basically like the team was coming up with like a lot of models uh, for valuation. And they wanted to be able to quickly check 
the effectiveness of the model, like test test the models um, and show their results. So we built like a library for our own, which called VA visualization, like we have package for uh, VA. Uh, that also used like um, Shiny so that like people can quickly import the library, um, send the model results into a function and they get like a dashboard which shows the results of the model, how good it is. Is it is it good? And we can they can easily compare like different models. The one um, then we um, this was great in terms of getting these visualizations out quickly, but supporting like people like multiple people on a single library was like a challenge we had. Then uh, we also tried to build like an integrated uh, platform for Value Australia, where you have all the applications in a server, which shares the disk, which shares the database, and every user can use them as a service. Basically, like up in in this scenario, like you need, you just need like a browser, you get like access to all the Value Australia datasets, apps. And they're all connected to each other. So if you want to like send it the uh, data set to someone, you just drop it in the shared folder. It goes. It's like everybody's sharing a big mainframe kind of a thing. So we got like uh, Python in them, like Postgres. Um, again, scaling was an issue. Once you have like three data scientists doing machine learning stuff, suddenly you need like 20 terabytes of disk space there. So it, it's not scalable in that way. Good for small um, workloads, not not great for like machine learning, uh, deep learning stuff. Um, then on a visualization side, like we have like a huge data set on property sales. I tried to use this super set. This is from Airbnb, built this um, library uh, platform for library for themselves. So which kind of like this dashboard on um, large data sets. Um, I tried my best to make like something out of it, but it was not fit for purpose, like it's good for medium sized data sets, which are like around 150 to 200 sets, it's fast. Once it crosses like 10, 15 million points in one uh, visualization, it kind of gives up. Uh, this one was, uh, it was actually really good. So OmniSci is an in-memory uh, database server. They have a very good um, front end to explore the data set. So you can see like it's crunching around like Five or six million data points uh, without any um, delay. So you can actually like connect. You can upload the things to the database, and it will. You can actually explore them in real time without any delay. Um, the catch here was it required a machine with a lot of GPU, which is very costly on Chrome. So I used to like um, upload the data, switch on the machine. Explore stuff, find out what I want, switch it off. So basically, it 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 used to cost us like five dollars an hour or something. Uh, it was like very expensive. So um, finally, for after doing the exploration part, like we wanted to build a tiny service to see the um, visualization. Um, the one which worked was um, a simple one which I did using. We just had a file, uh, data as a file and use DeckGL to um, and, and react, like visualize that very fast. Um, you could just upload it to a web server. It works and it used to like, um, it looked very nice. And for the project partners, it was like kind of a instant uh, click like, oh yeah, we can see what, what the data is showing us. Um, so this is where like we kind of like built a framework for building similar visualization. So essentially, we wanted something which is easy to scale for uh, larger data sets and like a lot, lot of users. Um, need a simple geo design component where you can move things free from blockings and proprietary systems. And this is what we came up with. It looks very simple, but works beautifully. So the database is a PostgreSQL, um, the tile server, Rust based tile server called Martin, which connects to the database. Uh, Postgres kind of like converts your database into a REST API, and Nginx kind of caches the results, so makes it much faster. Once you build this and like containerize in Docker, you can put it in a cluster, and then they can just scale uh, independently of each other. And they're all like um, 
if the database is not changing much, they can be like, they can, then they don't change their state very often. So basically you can scale them out in containers. Um, and we built like few visualization using this uh, framework. One is for that's visualizing modeling. Modeling effort for So that's property level um, land value model, which built for um, value general use of trails from Value Australia uh, project. So we were able to visualize property level data and linkages between the property level data quite. Um, so something like this, so you can actually like flick on a property, see like which properties are linked to it, and things like that. So, that was very successful and currently we're working with the ARC project where we're doing some trying to put like a modeling element to it and like add a geo design uh, stuff there like you can actually change stuff in the map and send that back to a modeling container um, that gives you back the results and then you visualize the results as well so something like in the end like you can select and change uh, bike lane and see like how much um, your bike ability has changed over the bike length. So that's an example of that. And I'm working on like few uh, exploratory stuff there. Can we parallelize the stuff at the user client side? So something which can. Um, so basically, like, oh, right, this one is a connected mapping system between discrete machines. So each table has its own laptop, which powers it, computer by person, but they're synced within each other. So you don't have a limit on like how big your screen can be. So because each one like uh, adds like power to that. So you can have like um, discrete machines, like so for example, two phones can map kind of like side by side map their whole thing. Um, in the future, we can add like, um, we can add like three stuff to it, like say so you can rotate the map, and it also adds you more points of input. So each point can be used for like uh, adding input to the map uh, independently of each other. So that's one which we're working on there. And for time, so finally, like this is a, um, a fun one which we did is like improving that link between the user and front end. So with all the um, um, I'm not going to do a live demo. I think we don't have time for that. But I have a video uh, which you can show. So what we can do is we can use the large language models to reduce that click and filter part of the visualization. So this one basically uses um, DaVinci 3.5, GPT 3.5 to investigate like a housing need. Uh, data set from a housing aid project. So essentially you can ask the map, like select all the, select all the uh, LGAs with more than 50% of housing need is not met. Uh, you can do like um, ge geographic queries, like so get all the LGAs which are adjacent to Sydney, uh, within 100 kilometers from Sydney and like get their output. So this one here, you can, yeah, you can select from what are adjacent to that. Um, you can ask for like the total average, so and so. So this is like, it shows once we kind of get over that um, link between the user and the visualization where like you, you don't have to like give them, a, say, okay, how do I explain this? We are removing one link on top of the that stack. So you have the base map, you have the layers, and then rather than you have the UI elements, you just have a natural language processor, which kind of gets you the UI elements. So, um, Yeah, you can, you can try filtering for within 100 kilometers, 50 kilometers from Melbourne, and you can find the average housing, unmet housing need for those ones, or you can see like for 2041, what's the unmet housing need. So that brings me to the end of the, I think we're doing good on time.
So to sum it, um, to summarize, there have been like since 2005, um, and Google Maps was released. Um, around 2015, there has been a huge change in terms of how maps are rendered and displayed. Uh, we have a complete, like, kind of a complete tooling around like visualizing uh, spatial data in the web, and in a very efficient way. Uh, we we kind of like in the last few years put together a framework of tools which can work together to achieve very quick, very um, easy to use visualization using <laughs> spatial social data. Um, we've used it for Value Australia project successfully. Um, we've been using it for a few other projects as well, housing need, uh, which I showed you. And there are like quite a lot of, so essentially like the conclusion would be like, there is so much which is already there. If we can develop stuff to translate that for users in terms of visualization, um, there's a huge amount of value there. So for example, one example is that um, the GPT-3 one. GPT-3 is like really good. If we can find a way to translate that into a spatial uh, context, which kind of reduces that cognitive uh, load for the users, the value is immense in that. So um, yeah, so that, that would be the conclusion. Set. So in the last five years, the amount of stuff that has happened in around Silicon Valley, if we can bring that to visualization for social data science, there's a huge amount of value in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Paula. Let's see. So there's uh, one comment in the chat. Maybe we'll maybe I'll start with that. Yeah. Uh, from Chris Sherman. Chris, I don't know if you want to turn on your camera and mic and make your comment in person, or I can just. I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. Um, so Chris said, ArcGIS enterprise solutions architecture would have solved the Twitter scalability concerns yeah. and consumed as a CPU dependent service. I'm not sure you considered this. Um, so that, that's my second disclaimer. So I, I kind of haven't worked with ArcGIS since I um, done masters. So basically, like I was doing a project and I passed, uh, I finished my masters and I lost access to ArcGIS. And I couldn't finish that. So that was the time I decided like I'm not going to get locked in in a proprietary service. But that, that being said, like ArcGIS S3 online, I've been working with it recently. We had like a few uh, story maps done there with uh, students in masters. Looks really good. Like, so if if something, if um, if there is an opportunity to work in an open environment, like yeah, ArcGIS would be like really good because they have all the tools, they have wealth of experience in that. Um, but it's just that not accessible um, once you're outside that uh, proprietary environment. But that's, that's me, but yes. So Bal, just that last one with the GeoGPT, which I guess is the same engine from ChatGPT. So being able to then spatialize and, and make those queries easier. Mm -hmm. So where do you think that's going? Because I guess with what you quickly showed that demo, you could be just, instead of using a GIS to put queries in, you could be just saying, show me all the local government areas that have a housing affordability issue, and it will create that on the fly. So you're just talking to your GIS or to your map yes. to now to get the queries. Um, so this, uh, it it's kind of like exciting when you see you type something and then like the SQL query made comes up from the GPT thing. But I was speaking to Yang uh, the other day about like how do we use it. There is there is a step we have to like jump through because some of the times it doesn't work. We get confused quite easily because um, most of the spatial stuff we do that's domain specific. Like so. Um, Complex spatial joints would get confused right now. Um, and some of the stuff which is natural language dependent, they, it gets confused as well. So I've, I've tried it out. But what I think is like, there is a, a 
to explain this. There is a jump between what you think in terms of what you want and being able to like get that from a map. So that jump is what uh, frustrates users when it comes to visual visual output. So if I do do a spatial visualization of some um, analysis and give it to a, a user, so they need to do that like extra. They need to know what to look for, where to change things, where what to select. That you like like the large language models can solve that. So that that can be like very smooth. So they basically like, even if it is not directly giving them the result, it can actually advise them how to get the results. They can ask like, how do I do this? So then it can give you like ways to do that. Yeah, so that's that's where I see like at least in the next months is going. Well, I keep looking very far in the future for the next month. <laughs> well, that's moving so quickly. It's only miles ahead of three, so. You'll be out giving the lecture next. <laughs> I mean, so I think taking on that, I think what you know, you made that point that what the natural language interface enables you to do is just bypass the UI, like a browser-based UI, effectively. Yeah. And you know, you showed that earlier slide. We said that there was a one promise at one point where everything would sort of become browser-based. Yeah. We, you know, we can visualize on a browser, but we can't really analyze on a on a browser because that UI is really hard to get. Yeah. To get. Yeah. You know, if you want a social scientist rather than a data scientist who doesn't know SQL like to, to work, it doesn't matter. You know, your, your UI is going to be so complex. So I think you know you could potentially sort of overcome that like, barrier. Um, yes. Not be standing all those caveats that you said, but I don't but understand it, what you're talking still, about. Yeah, like it still needs uh, some work in terms of how to do the prompts. Um, but Beyond that, like it, it's much more conversational, and um, I haven't like had any other stuff. So basically, it's not using the codex uh, part of it. So there is OpenAI has like a code generation, code completion of, uh, endpoint, and a general completion endpoint. This is using the general one. Okay. Uh, I still haven't like tried the code one. Um, so being able to use the co code generation one with uh, that might be a bit better, and GPT four might be like a lot better. Basically. I think it'll be interesting to see how it deals with is also dealing with uh, sort of nuance because a, a lot of the time if you've got like a geospatial query, it, it's there's like the subtle differences that like there, there's a reason that we that we have a relatively sort of mathematical language to sort of deal with the slight nuance between what you want. Yeah. But I mean I can see it. It could be interesting if there's kind of like a discussion where it, you know, you you prompt it for something and then it prompts you back to sort of deal with any ambiguity and, you know, just sort of check is this actually what you want or you know, there, there's multiple queries that are similar to what you're after. And, yeah. yeah, we can try like since we are done with the uh, local one running, so um, we can try something like let's see if we can click. Um, can you just speak into it or is it not? <laughs> <laughs> Until next month. Next month. <laughs> just whilst you're typing that, just, just want to weigh in. Um, database structure or cache planning at its at the start is key to how the end user point and visualization is experienced or rendering rendering enhancement so building the return of a essentially a map request is at its core fundamental to database design people yep. often fundamentally fall over at this point and it's where you see the dreaded spinning wheel um so I just want to highlight that database structure is key to ultimate success. Yeah, true. So even even this one. Um, so I'm asking like unmet housing need for 2021. The tables are formatted to conduce like to allow this, right? So if the table names are like a bit ambiguous, you get confused. So um, then you can see that like I'm saying LGA name Melbourne. 
because if I just say Melbourne, GPT-3 knows Melbourne's coordinates and it tries to like do some spatial stuff with the coordinates. So I have to specifically say like, look for an LGA named. Uh, that kind uh, of question, supposed to be 2021 or 2020, 2041? 2041, so it's a projected one. Oh, okay. Yeah, again, you need to know that the database has 2041 in there. It doesn't yeah, just yeah. have every exactly. Hour but I was curious if maybe the, the fact that it was a different number might have changed how the GPT is trying to deal with it. Yeah. Maybe it comes back and knows it's not 2041. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, when, it's when we haven't put in 2031 and it still figures it out and says, no, he's looking. <laughs> but, but another thing which I want, which I really like, is like I was able to like do this front end part, like in half a day, right? so just the, most of the time was spent in like finishing with the uh, OpenAI API and all that stuff, getting the map out, connecting the um, outputs to the map. That is much easier because that framework of like so each um, the data database is like Postgres it's in a container, um, the tile server is in a container. So I just like keep writing like new Docker compose and then it spins up five or six containers and I have another visualization right there. That's become much, much easier. So earlier doing this in a in a different like platform based sense, like building this within a car to DB or platform would be like take much more time than like um getting this linking them up is like harder than we think. Um yeah, so that that, that I was very su surprised with like how easy it is like to link these things. What is the is that put up a nine ninety six hundred? Is that just indicate? Is that indicating something for the household? Like, like, like that's the. Okay. Uh, oh, that's that's, that's, that's the, the answer. answer. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so if you go back to the point you're saying before, okay. you know, if GPT is, it's the point where we can actually say, do you mean Melbourne, the LGA, or the suburb, or the postcode, or whatever, like rather than just guess. That that would be the natural second um, step. So basically, like I would like to if. Given unending resources and ethics committee, but approves in a day. Um, I would like to like finish this part of it and then like get like a workshop of people. Um, ask, make them ask questions and then see like whether they find the right answer or like it's how how easy it is something like that. Um, then we can start to see like okay, is it useful? How useful it can be? Like what are the ways the kind of trying to find the information? I type like an SQL person, so my, my sentences are like SQL, select all the LJs and then get me the average things like that, but may not be true for like uh, people who don't code in SQL. I think that that's where like, because and as you said uh, earlier, that there's uh, like ChatGPT versions that are designed for sort of helping you code. And if they're just basically building an SQL query, then yes, that's useful. But where this becomes truly transformational is if we can get to the point where it's not uh, a human using ChatGPT to improve the ease with which they're writing an SQL query. It's where you have a fundamentally different way of interacting. But then you run into the fact that code and essentially mathematical language is kind of a lot more precise necessarily so than human language. Um, so you kind of have to work out, okay, well, what do we have to change and how, how do we constrain our interactions with ChatGPT to like that becomes a HCI um, problem and then a yeah it's a, I, really I swear like my job is easier because I'm an application oriented guy I don't know how it just works I have an API I have a use I kind of like know how to link them together quickly put together something which links but we do have uh, um, I think Richard and uh, Yang are like very experienced with working with language, a natural language processing. They might be able to help us fine tune this um, to what we want. But from an application point, point, point like I look at this as like, this is amazing, right? So we, we are being able to do this is amazing. Question, have you considered the discretion permissions nature of the data uh, uh, and its consumption within chat GPT? Um, there's a lot of IP. Client oh, yeah. credentials, uh, privilege, privileges, you know, I, there's, there's a long, long list of things that you would forego as soon as it goes through that URL. So, but, um, <laughs> have so you the considered way this? Is basically, the database stays in my laptop, right? So, 
So I kind of like describe the structure of the database in the prompt um, as like so the database has these tables, these uh, columns and stuff like that, and then ask. So can you convert this sentence into a um, SQL statement? Then I run the SQL statement locally. So the data is not going to open AI. No. So it's just the st structure of the database and what I want from that structure goes to the data uh, open AI. So it's it's convenient in that sense um, that like we're not sending the data anywhere. It's it's in the laptop at the end of the day. Okay, but, so the so the scalability of it is still hosted on your CPU. Yes, it's in my like it's a um, I specifically did this demo for the seminar. It's still okay. in my laptop. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, um, unless anyone has a burning last question, we might end there since we're a little after five. Uh, so um, I would just like to say thanks to Bala for a great presentation and a good discussion. So thanks again. Um, and just to let everybody know that our next seminar is on the 31st of March. Uh, Ed Wensing is going to talk about indigenous rights and how that uh, how those fit in or don't into uh, Australia's planning systems. So that should be good. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>